Right. Uh, welcome back to uh, ID24 for our 13th slot uh, of the day. Uh, ID24 is brought to you by the Pacello Group with a kind support from Barclays and the Center for Inclusive Design. Uh, you can find out more about those organizations on our website. If you like this video, uh, hit that like button and subscribe to the ID24 channel where you'll find all future event streams and videos. Uh, a quick hello and thank you to organizations who have decided to host their own local ID24 event. And currently, we should have Sapient Razorfish in Germany, who are streaming uh, from four locations in their offices. Don't forget to send questions uh, for the presenters by tweeting with the hashtag ID24. We'll pass these questions on to the presenters at the end of their presentation. And for each session, the best question will receive a free 90-day JAWS license. Note that on YouTube itself, the chat is open, but we are not monitoring it for questions to our presenters. It's just there for participants to chat amongst themselves. And now, without further ado, we have a double whammy session. We got uh, two connected presentations back to back. Uh, from Ruth McMullen and from my colleague David Swallow. And they're going to talk to us about sounding out the web, accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing people. And with that, I'll pass the floor over to you, Ruth. OK, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really great to take part in this initiative. My name is Ruth McMullen and I'm a librarian from York. I've known David, my co-presenter, for some years now as we have overlapping interests in accessible information. Earlier this year, David and I had the really inspired idea of doing some blog posts based on deafness and using the web. And when Dave first suggested it, I thought we'd only talk about um, subtitles. But as we spoke and we discussed, you know, mainly in coffee shops, I realised there is so much more to it. And we discussed lots of interesting theory, experiences and practical applications. And um, I discovered a lot about myself as a result. And the final blog posts were pretty brilliant, although I'm biased. So I heartily recommend reading them if you haven't already. So this is my personal tour of being deaf and my experiences day to day of being deaf and, and accessing services. And just to give you a caveat, it might be a slightly strange fusion of personal experience and theory because I work in this area too of service design for disabled users. And um, as a librarian, I'm very interested in online and information seeking behaviours. So a little bit about me. Um, so I'm a librarian and I work at Sheffield University, although I live in York and I specialise in copyright and intellectual property. I was born profoundly deaf and I have two cochlear implants. However, I didn't let this stop me from pursuing a passion for music. Um, I liked a lot of heavy metal music when I was in my teens, but uh, my taste improved in parallel with my hearing and my lack of teenage angst. I've played the clarinet since I was eight and for the past year, I've been trying my hand at singing. I've been very self-conscious about my voice for a lot of my life. I was bullied in school. So this has been a really fun way to, to move on from that, to explore and to have fun. And the, the Yorkshire Post ran a feature last year on deafness and music, and they included this photo of me. And I just really like it. I think it's quite, quite amusing. It's very fun. It's clearly how they think I like to play the clarinet, which is in the lavender bushes outside my office, getting stung by bees. I'm going to talk about three things in my presentation today. First of all, the deaf experience. How do I view being deaf? I'm going to try to explain to you as honestly and openly as I can. And then what are the effects of deafness? What's it like navigating the internet and other physical spaces? And finally, how can things be made better? I can't claim to have the definite answers, but I do hope to provide a useful perspective. So having a look at some terminology, because I think it's really helpful to place perceptions and experiences of, of disability in a theoretical concept. Here are three basic useful terms. 
First of all, we have variation, which means um, features and characteristics, such as hair, skin and eye colour, which usually have a genetic foundation. Then we have impairment, which is a variation outside of the normal range, as expressed by the majority of the population. So I put here a picture of the ear, because if a part doesn't work as normal, then a loss of hearing may result. So disability then can be seen as a combination of factors, impairment and social forces combined, would have a disabling effect on an individual. This picture here shows it really nicely. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it because it's from the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit. It shows how disability doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's a product of the individual and their encounters with the environment around them, such as buildings and physical spaces, other people and information. I also really like this quote from Harlan Lane, and he is a US academic who studies deafness. And the quote is, a disability is a classification of a physical, behavioural or mental difference from the norm that is attributed to biological causes in a particular culture in a given era as a result of the interventions of interested parties. And I've highlighted an interested parties here because I'm thinking about how to balance the interests of these stakeholders who participate in access to content and services, such as the creator, the designer, the user, and to think about how actions and services can then have a disabling effect on a spectrum of people with different physical and sensory abilities. So what does accessibility mean to me? This is quite, quite a personal perspective. I did this diagram which shows up some total of my PowerPoint skills. I was pretty proud of it. So in the centre we've got um, a person with an impairment who's attempting to access, interact and engage with content and services. And this is a two-way interaction. And then we have prisms running around the outside. We've got technology and the law. Access to content is increasingly through the prism of technology and the law also shapes this process, such as equality law and copyright law. So what's it like to be, to be deaf? My perspective as a deaf person, I had a brainstorm and these are the, the words I came up with. First of all, we have frustrating, which is a, you know, probably a pretty obvious one. There is a constant sense of a missing out or FOMO, as the cool kids might call it, and wondering also what normal hearing feels like. When I was younger, I did used to wonder a lot what life would be like if I didn't you know, have a hearing loss, but I do think about it less these days. Deafness is incredibly noisy. Deaf people often wear hearing equipment, which can make them seem very sensitive to, to loud sounds. When I got my first cochlear implant, I had to stop my mum from peeling sanitate because it would give me a head when I got my second implant, I was working in a shop and I, I used to win if people wrestled carrier bags in front of me. I remember one time I had training in, um, in a library office and I had to tell somebody I couldn't hear them because somebody was stirring tea across, across the office. I couldn't hear over the clinking of the teaspoon. And I could tell that, you know, the concept of a teaspoon clinking, drowning out a voice was a very, very unusual one for him. On the flip side, deafness can be very quiet and peaceful, particularly the last thing at night when I take my implants off, usually before bed so I can wind down after a busy and noisy day. It can be confusing. Not hearing things properly can be a very confusing and disorientating experience, both in terms of communicating and also being in places where you can't hear everything that's going on. It's invisible and it can be quite isolating and lonely at times. And also people you've known for a long time can still forget about it and forget about doing things which make it easier for you, such as speaking clearly. You can feel self-conscious, particularly when meeting new people for the first time, and also in unfamiliar situations, such as teaching and presenting and doing an online webinar. This is my first one. However, I do feel very proud of what I've managed to achieve in my life. And I feel that in some areas, my deafness has enriched and enhanced my life experience. But most of all, it's a really unique experience. I've got that up in, um, in rainbow colours. Every deaf person is different in how they hear and experience the world around them and in how they cope with, with their deafness. 
So I want to talk a little bit about um, language and coming back to those terms I mentioned earlier and the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit. Overall, I think it's a pretty great piece of work. It's done a lot of good. But last year, I did feel compelled to, to write a blog post about it. I agree with the principle of inclusive design and in there being a spectrum of needs. But I did feel that they were perhaps conflating inclusive design and situation, situational disability and also overusing the term disability. Let me give you an example. This is what Microsoft might call the persona spectrum. At one end of the scale, you have somebody with a permanent disability, such as me with my hearing loss. In the middle, you have somebody who is temporarily experiencing that condition, such as an ear infection, which is causing hearing loss. And right at the other end of the scale, we have somebody who is temporarily experiencing the effects of that condition, such as being in a noisy office and unable to hear well. All these people would benefit from subtitles, which is a design for all principle, which I totally agree with. But I did feel that Microsoft were quite black and white with their approach in saying in these situations that all these people were disabled, albeit in a different fashion. So when I blogged about it, I was very polite. I think there's you no know, too much self-righteous anger out there. And I did explain this term didn't upset or offend me personally, but I felt compelled to speak out to say that language which really does matter. Disability is a very powerful and complex term which should not be used lightly or carelessly without at least trying to understand these complexities. And after I blogged and tweeted, Microsoft got back in touch with a developer. You know, he requested my opinion, I gave it, and over time they subtly changed the toolkit to take this on board, hopefully in response to a range of views. And I use the term situational limitation which I feel is a much clearer and more accurate representation. So continuing on the theme of language, there's a big debate about the difference between people who identify with deaf with a capital D, who are likely to use um, sign language and make it a large part of their identity, and other deaf and hard of hearing folks who don't. This debate has been quite contentious in the past, for example, some schools of thought say that cochlear implants are bad because they rob capital D deaf people of their unique identity. I can't claim to speak for the BSL users because I've never used sign language, but I'm just raising this to raise awareness of a range of views and needs. And to say that from a service design perspective, I don't think the semantics matters too much. It's all about bearing in mind that range of needs that your users may have. So let's look at some UK statistics. In the UK, there are 11 million people with hearing loss. And of these, just under 10% are severely or profoundly deaf. And of these, 24,000 or thereabouts use British Sign Language as their first language. And in percentage terms, the BSL users are small, but they're, they're very significant in number. So continuing with our potato analogy and looking at this range of needs, giving deaf people choices about how to access content is really, really critical. So let's have a look at our MASH. I mean, that's very popular. A lot of people like MASH. Let's say MASH uses subtitles and these should be available for all video content. There's no question about that. Just do it. Chips are popular too. Let's say chips are well-structured content. Plain English writing with clear descriptions and metadata tags of all video and audio content. Right users are a real crowd pleaser. So give people a range of communication options like telephone, online chat, and offer the same services via all these options. Don't offer one service and then say call us to do X, Y, and Z. Then we also have our more specialised conversions like potato dolphin was which is very rich and tasty, much more complex, time-consuming and expensive to make. For example, with BSL videos, and they should be available at the very least for vital information. So now we're thinking about um, spaces and the effects of deafness. And one effect of being deaf is that one can get very easily disorientated especially in new and noisy environments. This is especially true of travelling, for example, by bus, train or plane, um, for example, being able to hear announcements and finding your way around. I have missed trains in the past due to not um, being able to hear because the 
the only notification is via an overhead announcement. It's a really good way to upgrade the first class on, on the next train. I stuck in a bike as well because I tend to cycle everywhere and I don't think the car drivers consider that a cyclist in front of them might not be able to hear very well. In buildings and rooms and at the physical space, again thinking about noise and navigation. And I say for a deaf person, the most vital things are what are the essential environmental cues? What information is presented and how? If you're standing in a long queue at a supermarket and you can't see the checkout, you need to know when to move forward without somebody yelling at you and annoyed customers behind nudging you. Space. Small and confined spaces such as narrow aisles in a shop are very stressful to deaf people. They're usually quite loud and echoey and also you're constantly worried that people are trying to move around you and let you know you, you can't hear them. How easy is it to find information such as departure times? Is this information given in a variety of ways? And is there a way to access further help and preferably from a person? So next we're looking at um, effects and information. And again with information it's about the choices that you're giving users. I mentioned some examples earlier on how to access content. And I'd say a really key thing for any company is having a mechanism for people to contact you. I really like um, Twitter direct messages and this is something that companies are increasingly using. It's very, very private. A good recent example is um, Monzo, which is an online bank, which I've started using. They're totally fantastic. They, they do um, troubleshooting via Twitter, via the browser, via an app, and they'll offer all of their services. So recently my um, card details were accessed and they stopped the card within 10 minutes of me notifying them on Twitter and refunded the, the money which was taken. And if you contrast that to, to your more traditional bank, there's quite a famous case in 2012 with a lady who had her car stopped when she was buying a car, despite letting the bank know in advance she was going to be buying a car on that date. They said she had to call them to get her you know, account unlocked, despite being a really, really long standing customer with a known hearing impairment. And in the end, the car salesman had to drive her in so that she could complete the, the transaction, which was terrible customer service and really embarrassing for everyone concerned. So I've got a slide on unplanned accessibility because um, I gather it's quite a popular term at the moment and this can happen in both physical and online spaces. So physical might be having a meeting in a noisy room but being able to move to a quiet space if flexible breakout rooms are provided that would be really valuable at um, a conference for example. Or online it might be having a transcript of videos from when you made them and being able to email them in response to a request. I really like um, this quote from the, the University of Southampton and they say that um, accessibility rarely happens by chance and that's true that the paradox of unplanned accessibility is that you need basic structures in place first such as space and information to actually allow it to, to happen. So it might just be a flexible approach and giving staff training, disability, aware, disability awareness and also empowering staff to respond to the unexpected and delegating authority allowing them to respond to things as needed. So I had a really um, nice encounter at a theatre about a year ago. Um, I was staying for a week in a different UK city. I went to the local large theatre and requested information about capturing performances. They didn't have any that week, which isn't unusual, and they were really apologetic. So what they did, they booked me a seat on the front row, which um, they're, they're reserved for people with disabilities, hearing or sight impairment. They then gave me a transcript of the play and a really quite charming handwritten note to show the usher which gave permission to keep my phone on and use the light to read the transcript you know, in airplane mode and uh, I felt sorry for the cast because they might have thought I was really bored but um, it was all a slightly strange situation but it worked really well. I was able to access the play but really really grateful for their, their creativity and their help. So thinking about the internet as a space, a physical space through which people can access content, you wouldn't have a large unstructured barren landscape where people 
couldn't navigate or do what they want to do. So we think about how to give it shape, form, colour and variety and allow a range of people to carry out a range of tasks. So what's great about the internet for, for deaf people? I've got three, three examples here. It's largely visual, which is mostly a really, really good thing. It's opened up new communication channels. When I was 15, all of my classmates started using MSN Messenger, which probably tells you how old I am. Suddenly I felt part of the conversation again, whereas in the classroom I wasn't. At work, it's more common now to say that have a Skype meeting rather than a telephone call, because these can be pre-arranged, they're more personal, but they're also really great for, for lip reading and for facial expression. Because of the internet, I feel like I can get enough information to make up for missing it in other areas. At a conference, for example, the, the one today, you can follow the hashtag, and that way you'll get most of the, the pertinent points. I can also read news apps on the go to make up for missing the radio. I can bookmark and download content and curate it in new ways, giving me a feeling of control and ease. That's due, of course, to um, hardware devices as well, allowing access to a range of apps. And uh, the not so good about the internet for deaf people. The really big one is information overload. Deaf people are very visual and they can get overwhelmed by information quite quickly. We also get eye fatigue due to processing everything visually and having to lip read people. This information overload can then lead to lack of choice if information is poorly structured or described. I spend a lot of time flicking through videos to work out you know, what the content is. A searchable transcript with subtitles would make this job so much easier. And technology for deaf people hasn't always kept up. Recently at work, and this was at a previous workplace, I requested a fire alert system such as a, a pager or an S SMS message in case I've missed a fire alarm. And this is what I've got. It's quite a large little alarm clock. And I had the same sort of thing about 20 years ago when I was still at school. So it's absolutely massive. It's very big, it's very heavy. Um, if I wanted to take it to meetings in another office, it came with a really nice, like, trendy carrier bag so I could carry it around with me. So that's just a, a fun example. But there are some really good solutions out there, such as Bluetooth adapters for my cochlear implants, which allow me to stream music directly to Spotify with no wires, which is incredible. It makes all my hearing friends very jealous. These adapters cost over £1,000. So as long as we marginalise solutions, the market will remain very niche and expensive for deaf people. So um, this is to give you a few recent examples of good practice that I've come across on, on, on the web. First is BBC Radio on Twitter. They make short videos of all their interviews, which is a, a really great way to bring content to a new audience. And they also subtitle all of their videos, and those subtitles work within a Twitter stream across multiple platforms, which I find really, really impressive. And here's a subtitled news video on Facebook, which um, I've never seen that before, subtitles and videos on Facebook. And this is from an am amateur news organisation. By contrast, The Times, a big national newspaper, which I've given lots of money to for a subscription for many years, they never ever subtitle their news videos. And coming back to banking, I had an experience with Halifax quite recently. So I was making an online bank transfer, and in order to do that to a new person, you have to verify it. Either Halifax call you, and you can key in or say the code, which is instant or they send you a code by post, which takes a few days. And they say on the web page, hearing impaired customers can wait for up to 15 seconds before keying in the code and hanging up the call. And this has always worked absolutely brilliantly until recently. I was doing it again and again and again, and they kept calling back, so I knew it wasn't working. So I plugged all of my Bluetooth equipment in and listened to the call properly, and I realised the timing of the automated message had changed, it got longer. It was now 25 seconds to wait before you keyed in the code. And they hadn't updated their information to, to reflect this. 
I managed to solve it, which was lucky, but a person who had no listening options would have to request a postal code or go into branch to sort it out, which is quite a bad customer experience. I'm finishing with a subject which is really close to my heart as a librarian who deals with copyright systems and accessible information. And I have some, some questions for you. With your content and services, is it accessible in line with the principles we've talked about? Can the content be copied and interacted with where appropriate? Visual electronic information is a total game changer for deaf people, but we usually need to be able to do stuff with it. To give you an example, I'm studying for a law degree by distance learning. The content now online via Lee is very good, but it's totally static. So I have to manually copy and paste it everywhere, elsewhere, in order to highlight it and do, do things with it. If there's a mechanism for, for downloading or interacting with it within the platform, that would make my life so much easier. And then interoperability. Is content compatible on a range of devices? For example, could text be saved as a PDF and then worked on with a tablet? Do subtitles work consistently across all devices? Channel 4's 4OD service is pretty terrible. Subtitles often work on a laptop, but not an iPad or the stream where they don't download. So you really need to provide a consistent user experience. Aside from the moral and legal imperatives of making content and services accessible, we should bear in mind that we are largely facing a new generation of deaf people who are growing up as expert users of technology. And they will vote for their feet if they're not happy with the services on offer. And thanks very much for listening to me. No, no pun intended there. I think um, Dave is going to take over from here, but I really welcome questions from you either now or later on. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ruth. Yeah, we're, we're going to do questions at the end. So now I'm going to pass over to David. Hello. So my name is David Swallow. Um, I'm an accessibility engineer here at uh, TPG. Um, and as uh, Ruth mentioned, this this talk emerged from from a blog post uh, that we uh, wrote for the uh, TPG blog. And what we uh, hoped was by showing how people actually uh, benefit from accessibility guidance, it would provide more encouragement uh, and motivation to uh, implement it. And um, Ruth uh, very kindly agreed to let me interview her, and we. Uh, being deaf um, and in particular how it affects the use of the web. We'll also discuss some of the things uh, that make life easier for Ruth on the web. So following on from Ruth's experience, which you've just uh, been listening to, uh, I want to uh, share some of the practical guidance that we've put together on how to improve uh, accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing people and to try and draw attention really to this, this uh, often overlooked aspect of web accessibility. So um, if you can, uh, take a look at this photo of a group of students uh, sitting around a table uh, discussing something. Uh, could you spot which uh, one of these students uh, is deaf? Uh, don't write in. Uh, I'd be surprised if you could, um, because uh, as Ruth alluded to, uh, deafness and, and hearing loss is often seen as an invisible uh, disability. Um, so these are disabilities that are not uh, immediately apparent. There's no visible supports to suggest a disability. Um, no canes, wheelchairs, uh, no, no use of sign language, etc. Uh, chronic pain conditions or mental health issues often fall into this category because there's no outward signs that a person has them. Uh, so if a deaf or hard of hearing person does not use cochlear implants or hearing aids, or perhaps uses very discreet hearing aids, uh, then their disability may not be obvious. Um, it may mean you're not treated differently in any way, um, but it also might mean that people uh, fail to understand that they need to adapt their behavior, uh, that you might need uh, a bit of extra help, a bit of extra consideration. And a similar uh, invisibility occurs when it comes to web accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing people. 
the largely visual nature of the web means that we tend to focus on supporting people who are blind or partially sighted. Um, as part of my, my research, um, I interviewed many web developers about their knowledge of web accessibility. And despite being uh, very passionate and enthusiastic about it, uh, they mainly talked um, about supporting blind people using screen readers by putting alternative text on images. And so deaf and hard of hearing people seem to be overlooked when it comes to the web. And some developers I've encountered have even been quite dismissive of the needs of uh, deaf people. Audio was seen uh, as, a, as a trivial enhancement literally the, the bells and whistles of a website, and not an essential aspect of the user experience. Um, people just assume that it's uh, just about audio and slapping subtitles on a video. And certainly subtitles are important, um, but there are lots of other things you can do uh, to improve accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing people. Having said that, uh, for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, one of the most obvious things you can do is to provide uh, subtitles or captions. And as you'll know, subtitles and captions are the words shown at the bottom uh, of videos and animations to explain what is being said or happening. Uh, and here we have a, a subtitle screen grab of uh, Robert De Niro in uh, Taxi Driver uttering the, the, the famous line, uh, and I won't attempt the accent, uh, well, then who, who the hell else you talk, you talking to? you talking to me? So there's actually a subtle difference between the two terms. Subtitles um, refers only to uh, spoken content, whereas captions also includes descriptions of non-speech sounds, um, such as music, applause, and laughter. Um, however, outside of uh, North America, the terms are often used interchangeably. So subtitles and captions primarily benefit uh, people who are deaf and cannot hear audio, audio, people who are hard of hearing cannot hear some of the audio, um, people with cognitive and learning disabilities uh, who need to see and hear the content to, to uh, better understand it. However, subtitles and captions also have many additional benefits. Um, they can be used in loud environments, such as a busy office where you cannot hear the audio. Um, they can be used in quiet environments, such as a library uh, or the, 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 the quiet carriage on a train, ideally. Uh, where you cannot or, or should not turn on sound. Uh, they, they benefit people who are less fluent in the language spoken. And the content in text form, such as caption files and transcripts, can then be better indexed by search engines, making it easier to find. Uh, an Ofcom study um, from a, a couple of years ago found that of 7.5 million people uh, who regularly use subtitles in the UK, only 1.5 million of these are uh, deaf or hard of hearing. So in other words, uh, captions and subtitles benefit everyone. Um, and while uh, subtitles and captions are pretty standard on videos from more official sources, although as Ruth said, not, not always the case, um, they tend to be lacking where video is shared spontaneously, such as on uh, social media. You'll have noticed the growing predominance of video content on Facebook and Twitter, which are seldom captioned. Um, the problem is exacerbated by live streaming platforms such as Facebook Live or Periscope. And uh, in my interview, Ruth referred to this problem as uh, unplanned accessibility. It's this spontaneous, informal sharing of information, uh, both online and offline, that can inadvertently exclude people with, with disabilities. And although it is admittedly a difficult problem, there are steps you can take. There are dedicated captioning services available who will produce high quality captions and transcripts of video content, sometimes in real time, and is being live captioned, uh, as are all of the presentations today. But these services can be very expensive. Thankfully, YouTube also has some useful built-in functionality for adding your own subtitles to your video content. Once you've uh, uploaded a video, uh, you select the transcribe and auto sync button, uh, then you play the video and type the words as they are spoken. When you're finished, YouTube matches the dialogue timing of the video to the words you've typed, and then you're pretty much done. And you can publish your captioned video to the web. And the advantage of this approach is that you can also download a file that contains your captions. 
And then you can upload the video to Facebook uh, or other social media platforms and attach the captions file there. Now, if that seems like too much of a hassle or perhaps you have hours and hours of video footage to caption, luckily uh, YouTube and, and some countries, Facebook um, offer free automatic video captioning. And these rely on uh, speech recognition technology and machine learning algorithms to generate those captions. And while the technology is improving all the time, it's not yet reached anything near 100% accuracy. And studies show that the intelligibility of captioning drops dramatically at even a 2% error rate. And as a result, a lot of the time, YouTube's automatically generated captions uh, are incomprehensible. And they're, they're often so wrong that they've led to the, the creation of the caption fail uh, meme. Uh, I did try and find a funny caption fail for this slide. Um, but most of them were obscene uh, or offensive. Uh, but while watching uh, Postman Pat with my daughter, this one popped up. Um, and here uh, we have a, a screen grab from the opening credits to uh, children's TV favorite, Postman Pat. Uh, while the spoken lyrics uh, are, uh, and I'm not gonna sing this, um, everybody knows his bright red van. All his friends will smile as he waves to greet them. The automatic captions read, everybody knows his Bryce bread fan. Oh, his friends will smile ASCII waves too. So only the slightest difference there can make it uh, difficult to understand. Uh, for people who can, who can hear, uh, inaccurate captions can be entertaining, but for deaf people, they're often extremely frustrating. Uh, for if you imagine you're trying to learn something from an educational video, uh, that's littered uh, with, uh, with such mistakes. Uh, and these examples are taken from the University of York's YouTube channel. While the university had originally relied upon automated captions, uh, the results were less than desirable. So um, uh, the top one there says, what, what it should say is as well, but your reading list will often include journal articles. It actually says, uh, the automated captions actually say as well, but you're eating less what often include Jan articles. And similarly with the, the bottom uh, example, uh, what it should say is uh, each of whom offer the journal you need, check the dates offered by each provider. Actually says in the, the automatic subtitles, each of whom offer the channel you need, check the dates of the fight to provide. Um, unfortunately, many of YouTube's video creators are unaware of how the quality of captions affect those uh, who rely on them. And because automatic captions uh, exist and are seemingly good enough, um, it's easy to think that providing your own accurate captions is unnecessary. It's almost like the, the availability of automatic captions leads to this sort of false sense of accessibility. Luckily, YouTube at least gives you the option to review and edit uh, automatic captions. And it's very easy to, uh, to um, go in and either edit the caption text or the caption timing and you can download a caption file and, and edit it directly. But making the effort to clean up the captions and ensure uh, they are accurate uh, really makes a difference and ensures that deaf and hard of hearing people have access to the same information. Uh, not only do captions need to be accurate, they also need to be in sync with the audio content. And to illustrate this uh, quite abstractly, uh, this slide shows some synchronized swimmers. Um, one advantage of using automated captioning uh, is that they uh, they do a pretty good job of automatically matching up the timings. Uh, and if it's a bit out of sync, you can easily correct it. However, some video producers choose to generate their own captions from an existing transcript. And when you take that approach, it's important to make sure that each line appears on screen at about the same time the audio is heard. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, and you may still notice the odd delay here or there. But again, making this effort to keep the captions in sync goes a long way to improving the user experience for deaf and hard of hearing people. One uh, example of good practice that Ruth mentioned uh, is the British University's Film and Video Council's BOB, the Box of Broadcasts, which is an on-demand TV and radio service for education. And it provides access to 2 million broadcasts dating back to the, the 1990s. Uh, Bob provides the, the transcripts to all of these broadcasts. Uh, and just 
a, a transcript is the same word for word content as captions, but presented in a separate document, usually without any time information. Transcripts are usually sufficient for audio only content. But as Ruth mentioned in the talk, transcripts alone are not really an acceptable alternative to uh, video content. Deaf users would have to switch back and forth between watching the video and reading the transcript. It can lead to a very distracting, very disjointed experience. They can easily lose their place, miss key elements on the screen, and to get out of sync with the video. So this slide here shows a clip from Professor Brian Cox's Wonder of the Universe uh, program. Uh, as part of the, 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 the Bob uh, website. And the approach that Bob has taken is to present the transcript alongside the video and highlight the words as they're spoken on the screen. And this gives the advantage of, of subtitles, uh, which are fairly well synchronized. Um, you can also see the subtitle in context. Um, and because the transcripts, transcripts are indexed, they can be searched um, say for uh, research purposes. So in short, the transcript alone does not offer a comparable experience for deaf or hard of hearing people. Subtitles and captions are necessary to make videos accessible. And to make them really usable by deaf and hard of hearing people, you should make sure they're accurate and make sure they're closely synchronized with the audio. Uh, now I'll admit this next one is something I hadn't given a lot of thought to before I uh, chatted to Ruth. Uh, if sales chart for people with visual impairments, you might describe both the uh, purpose of the chart, its accessible names, so quarterly sales in 2017. You might also describe the data that the chart shows. So sales rose sharply in the first quarter, dropping to a record low in the third quarter, something like that. Um, Similarly, to describe a video to people with hearing impairments, you should try and describe both its purpose and what it contains. And in fact, Ruth likens this to alternative text for someone with a hearing impairment. So if for whatever reason it's uh, impossible to provide subtitles, or even if you can provide them, then try to also make some attempt to summarize and describe the content. And this could be a brief description of what the video contains, or even just a list of topics or songs uh, that it includes. Um, then to illust illustrate this, uh, this slide shows a black and white picture of a handwritten set list of songs taped to the, the stage in front of a band. Now, in my interview with Ruth, she recalled uh, a video of Aretha Franklin uh, that a friend had shared on Facebook. And the slide shows the very uh, clip she was referring to. Ruth watched a bit of the video and saw Aretha playing the, the piano and she could see Carole King in the audience and she could tell that she was playing a Carole King song, uh, but which one? Ruth didn't know because she couldn't hear. Uh, there were no captions uh, and there was no description of the song she was playing. Now, a, a description has been provided, but it doesn't include what song. It just says, the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, singing for Carole King, December 2015. Um, Ruth also mentioned watching a piano player playing um, Gershwin songs on YouTube that lacked um, any description of what songs were being played. And she said, I, I can't skip through and listen to fragments. I need to know what's in there before I make a choice to watch it. And I feel like I don't have that choice if I don't know what's in it. So in addition to captions, providing a summary of audio and video allows deaf and hard of hearing people to make an informed decision about what they watch. Now, this next one isn't something that directly impacts uh, deaf and hard of hearing people, but it can result in awkward situations. And you may be familiar with posts on social media that play automatically when you open them or even scroll past them. Some sites and uh, news websites are a common culprit, even play little videos outside of the the current viewport making it difficult to, to work out where the audio is coming from. And this slide shows a news article from uh, CNN about some sharks that were spotted off the Southern California coast. And as soon as the page loads, a tiny little media player begins playing a video related to the article. But this can be frustrating for anyone to have audio suddenly blaring out with no obvious way of switching it off. You might be in the quiet carriage of a train or a meeting, or you might already be listening uh, to music. 
Uh, and also people who use a screen reader can, can find it hard to hear the speech output of this, or the audio playing at the same time. However, it can be particularly frustrating for deaf and hard of hearing people who may have difficulty monitoring the volume level of, of audio of videos uh, who might be completely oblivious uh, that they're, they're playing at all. Uh, Ruth described how this had caused a couple of embarrassing situations in, in the office where she'd been browsing the web and there were video adverts that play sound uh, without her realizing. This is a, a, another example. Uh, this website's for a hotel in Berlin. Um, it immediately booms out a waltz by Shostakovich uh, upon loading. Uh, but the control to switch it off is not very obvious at all, and it's right at the bottom of the page. It's indicated by an arrow on the screen. Um, no one really likes audio that plays automatically, so try to avoid it completely. Um, the W3C's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines suggest drawing the line at three seconds, anything longer than that, and they discourage the practice of automatically starting sounds. Uh, one exception to this is if the user is aware that when they clicked a link that the preceding page would would uh, autoplay, for example, link to YouTube, or if the uh, user has purposely enabled um, autoplaying. Uh, but if what, for whatever reason it's, it is unavoidable, then make sure that users have a means of easily turning it off, just allowing users to start any sounds themselves once a page is loaded rather than requiring them to stop them. It goes without saying that deaf and hard of hearing people rely heavily on visual information. Therefore, it's important to ensure your content is structured clearly using headings, paragraphs, lists, tables, and, and, and other elements. To illustrate this uh, abstractly again, uh, this slide shows a silhouette of some scaffolding against a, a blue sky uh, with some, some birds, or swallows, I don't know, uh, perched on it. Anyway, structure helps users understand what information is contained in web pages and how that information is organized. When headings are clear and descriptive, users can find the information uh, they seek more easily. Web page. Um, easily scannable and easy to process. As with the description on videos, uh, a web page that is clearly laid out and easy to process helps people make informed choices about whether to engage with content. Uh, it can also prevent information overload as there's nothing worse than wading through a website that's poorly laid out with no headings and huge blocks of text. However, uh, while uh, clarity uh, is crucial, it's important not to make the content too simple and potentially patronizing. Certain guidance for so, uh, supporting deaf and hard of hearing people promotes the avoidance of complicated words or complex phrases and figures of speech. And while this is generally good advice, clear English, uh, the emphasis needs to be on don't, don't overcomplicate it rather than don't use big long words. Use whatever is appropriate for the content and the audience. And if you're talking about uh, a legal treaty or a physics theory, whatever it is, then and it goes without saying that you might have to use words that are, that are more than a, a couple of syllables. So, finally, um, underscoring each of these suggestions I've mentioned is, is, is an emphasis on clear communication and flexibility of content. And to illustrate this, uh, the slide shows some bendy straws uh, in rainbow colors. So whether it's providing clear, accurate, and synchronized subtitles and captions, providing a summary of the content, or ensuring that audio does not play automatically and can be easily turned off or on, uh, and making sure your content is clearly structured. Don't overwhelm your users. Make it easy for them to navigate your website. Provide enough information that allows them to make informed choices about what they pay attention to and where possible uh, allow your users to adapt content into a form that's useful uh, or accessible for them and ruth talked about her her iphone being a bit of a lifesaver in this regard as it allowed her to get information and modify it in a way that works for her for example she can't hear a radio very well in a room but if she plugs in a bluetooth headphone she can listen to a, a radio program uh, via an app so ultimately, content that's flexible enough to be delivered by captions, indexed by transcripts, enlarged by screen magnifiers, rendered by screen readers, is a key uh, principle of web accessibility. And while many of the tips in this presentation are uh, essential for deaf and hard of hearing people, they 
ultimately benefit everyone. So that's all for me. Uh, hopefully between us, we've given you some insight into, into Ruth's experience of being deaf and how it affects her use of the web and offered you some uh, practical tips on how you can improve accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing people. Perfect. Thank you very much, David and Ruth. Uh, I'm just going to unmute Ruth and I'm going to also stop the presentation thing so Ruth can see me. If I can work it out, just bear with me one second. Right. Uh, stop presenting. There we go. So hopefully now anybody who speaks, uh, they'll be visible and I'll scare the audience at home by turning on my camera as well. Right, we had one question. Uh, during your presentation. Uh, I, I also posted uh, one of my experiences with uh, Twitter, uh, sorry, with YouTube auto captions. You can have a look at that later, David. Uh, I don't know what you mean about them being obscene. That's not my experience. <laughs> so you can also stop your, your screen sharing, uh, David, if you want, uh, so we can see your. You sure. See you. Um. <laughs> if not, don't worry. Uh, one, there you are. Uh, so one question that came in, uh, and also the winner of the uh, 90 days JAWS license uh, for this particular session uh, came from Man of Sterl uh, at Uglychim. And the question was, uh, as Apple and Microsoft are putting focus on accessibility, have you noticed any improvements of corruptions or accessible features on the web, or is legal action a more effective stick as seen in the USA? Okay, shall I, shall I help you start? Go. Well, I don't know a huge amount about American accessibility equality law. I gather it's more prescriptive than the law in the UK. I think somebody told me once it might even specify captions as a measure required for you know, equal access. I think in the UK it's much more vague. So, for example, providing a transcript would be equal to providing subtitles, whereas, as we've, we've touched upon, it's not really providing an equi equitable experience for people who are who are deaf. So I think it's asking yourself why, why you're providing this. Is it to comply with legal requirements or is it to provide the best possible user experience? As to um, captions improving, I think they have improved over time. About 18 months ago, I've seen these terrible captions all the time, but people are catching on to it. And um, those people are becoming more tech savvy. They're starting to edit their own captions within YouTube. I think that's, that's something I've noticed. Yeah, so, I also think the, the actual algorithms, I mean, machine learning is now the, the hot topic at the moment. And I, I think one of the effects is that some of the auto captions are really, really good. I mean, we we see that with ID twenty four, we we actually have our dedicated captioning, uh, but the auto captions in YouTube. In the meantime, while we wait to upload the uh, professionally uh, created captions, are actually not mm. that bad as an initial stopgap at the very least. Yeah, I felt I felt a bit. Um a bit critic, over critical of them really because like, they definitely have improved um and i'm just trying to find it in in response to the, the blog article someone uh, linked to a new system that's been developed um uh, which was incredibly accurate well from what i'm from what i'm aware um i'll try and dig that out and and, and post a link somehow uh, yeah a bit, you know very accurate automatic captions so yeah, i think no, things are no. definitely improving things are improving absolutely right and now not to scare the kids at home I'm Thank you. 